dear black americans <laughs> can we just give up on this whole pan-african one love uh brotherhood of man and sisterhood and all this we are one and all that listen let me tell you the reality on the ground the women do not have the empowerment that your ancestors fought for they are just now scratching at the surface they don't even have shoes they get their shoes from america we gotta ship them shoes they, they had to use the shoes that we have extra leftover shoe. They use leftover shoes that the USA teams didn't want. Save your breath. They're not interested. They don't even know what you're talking about. Because for them, it's survival. It's survival. Every day in this Africa, it's a survival. Light off, no water, living conditions. And you're here coming to talk about Marcus Garvey. The doubt on Pan-Africanism is not being voiced for the first time. Certainly not by this sister only. And really this boils down to just a case of relationships between the continental African brothers and sisters and Africans of diaspora. The tension around culture is a big part. And if this sister thinks it is just Africans who are doing this, then you should listen to Gilbert Arenas, who spoke about the South Sudanese team playing the American team in what, for lack of a better word, really borders on xenophobia. And then we got the males almost lost to some Africans. <laughs> God, God damn, dog. We, we almost lost to the we almost lost, come on, man. And the king had to save. The king had to save us. <laughs> I know the LeBron haters are mad. <laughs> he did it again. <laughs> we almost lost to the, <laughs> to the, the Ahi Ahi tribe. This is crazy. They don't even have shoes. They get their shoes from America. We got to ship them shoes. They, they had to use the shoes that we have extra, leftover shoes. They use leftover shoes that the USA teams didn't want. All ah, right, y'all can use these. They don't even have basketball rims, though. <laughs> I, I seen, I seen uh, Matumbo's, was it Matumbo's? No, Bo's father, Matu, Manu Bo. I seen he had to walk, what, an hour and a half to go shoot basketball. 25 miles for a basketball rim. That is crazy. We lose it to people who don't even, they got baskets in the back. They they shooting on peach baskets in dirt, no shoes. Listen, let me tell you the reality on the ground. Yeah. The average Ghanaian wants to go where you've come from. Let me tell you that is a fact. I've worked for the British High Commission before for many years. I've seen Ghanaians come in with documents showing they've sold their land, taxes, houses, even farmland, just to raise the money to get a visa to go to the UK. All this preaching about Malcolm X and uh, what's the other one, Marcus Garvey, and we are all one sister, brother, they're not interested in that. Let me teach you tea today. We need money because the average Ghanaian needs money to chop, to eat, to pay school fees, to open up his kiosk every morning to sell. The reality on the ground is life is hard in Ghana. They all want that life that you don't want. I'm a prime example. It's like we've crossed lives. We in the West, we want to come to Africa to enjoy because we've, we're done with there. We've been there, done it, seen it. They also want to go there to do it, see it, done it there, to get money, to build houses, to have a better future. Some Ghanaians hate Ghana. Let me tell you, for, I know Ghanaians that say they hate Ghana for everything that it stands for. So please, all this coming in like you are the black savior to come and teach Africans about pride and uh, self of self worth and knowing that you are you, you know you are an African and coming to teach and preach, sister, brother, save your breath. 
They're not interested. They don't even know what you're talking about. Because for them, it's survival. It's survival. Every day in this Africa, it's a survival. Light off, no water, living conditions. And you're here coming to talk about Marcus Garvey. That's not going to feed anyone here. If you want to come and embrace Africa with all your beads and all your extend your uh, uh, braids and your uh, what is it your dreadlocks and your dashiki and you want to have that true African experience, wonderful. But leave the Africans alone to fight for their lives and get on with their lives. The preaching is enough, please. If those sentiments really carry the entire weight of the African continent. Then Gilbert Arenas, who recently spoke about the South Sudanese team, might as well be speaking about African Americans and how they feel about Africans in general. Let's have a candid debate about this whole thing about Pan Africanism. Because the reality is, there are Africans of the diaspora who have come to the continent, have managed to navigate the continent, and found a home. And largely because they did their homework. But there are also brothers and sisters from out there who've come to the continent and faced such difficult time. Sadly and tragically, some also lost their lives. It really boils down to relationships, the whole point of culture between brothers and sisters out in diaspora and those on the continent, continental Africans. Ghana has been receiving a lot of bashing in terms of the whole idea that they want to chop your money and all these accusations about Africa just being about the money grab. But the flip side to that is the reality that yes, this is a developing country. There are certain systems you will not be used to. There will be cultural differences that obviously you will note. The thing that our black sisters have experienced in the West, for example, the trauma, the pressure of that society has ensured that to survive, the African sister out there has had to toughen up, develop a thick skin around dealing with issues of race, segregation from back in the day, brutal police force out in the streets. But it's a challenge on the continent. When you arrive here and you find love here, that difference of a patriarchal society and an independent sister who stands her ground, who wants to have her way, and who wants to have her voice heard, soon becomes a problem. Some of the sisters we've lost in recent times, in Gambia, and I watched a story also by Go Black to Africa about a sister who had lived in the US came back home with her children, her American children, and uh, soon met somebody in Ghana, lost her life based on differences around money, control of money, and who has a say in the home. Those are harsh realities. So the experience that I've observed over time is that those who have come to the continent and have come as couples, You've got your emotional support from your partner. And that because you are both bringing a fresh set of eyes on the continent, you are both experiencing the continent as new citizens, if you wish, then you are able to offer each other emotional support, even economic support, and navigate the continent as partners who are on a mission to make it here. The reality is if you find a brother who does not have an appreciation for Western ideals, has not traveled, has a closed mindset that has never left his village, then you'll be facing challenges of deeply rooted culture, walls that you cannot breach, that you cannot reach, that not even the language of love can break. Because in reality, love is not enough to carry you through some of those cultural storms, some of those differences that are so heavy 
you know, around roles played in the home. Expectations of society, expectations from in-laws. That in some communities, you are seen as the help at home. Yet, you're thinking, you've got your education, you've got your money, you've got your own independent mind and you can stand your own ground. It becomes a problem. So those nuances around culture is something that sisters who are single need to be aware of. A sister, DIY, shout out to DIY House and Farm in Ghana, came to Africa on a mission to connect to the continent, the spirituality, and it fell apart. In that whole process, she met somebody, found love, and lives in Ghana. Within that period of time that she's been around, three years or so, she shares her experiences, the challenges she's faced, and the realities around the differences culturally, and the role of the female in society in Ghana. It is a different world. In all honesty, what happens to the American woman when she comes here, who she was, who she learned to be, in her home country, everything that her parents taught her, her guardians taught her to empower her, to uplift her, to strengthen her through her toxic experiences, they are completely almost shattered when she comes into an environment like this because the women do not have the empowerment that your ancestors fought for. They are just now scratching at the surface. Those are things you have to be very cognizant of. Who are you meeting? Have they ever walked out of the simple village where they grew up? Can you really relate if the idea of a wife is the one who will carry a pot from the river? Is the one who will do all the domestic chores at home and still be expected to do the wifely duties at sundown? Important questions. I think very much like Africans who also travel to the West, they face culture shock. They find life is different. The woman's place in society is more assertive, more independent. And so it is something that they also have to find a way to deal with, especially for the men. But for sure, the biggest aspect of culture shock is the whole race relations. That as an African person, you have lived without ever having to look too much over your shoulder, wondering whether you'll return home safe at the end of the day. Those are experiences that you soon find in the West. And even for an African person who then has to raise a child, even if the child was born here, and now find themselves in the West, then they soon realize that they have to have the race talk. How do you relate with a police officer? should you find yourself in a situation. You are driving, you are flagged down by a cop, or there's an incident, how should you respond? And for a good number of those who are coming from Africa, I think that is the rudest awakening. That you think you are African and you consider yourself African, but as soon as you arrive in the Western capitals, you are all bandied together. And the responsibility then is for both of us, those who are out there and those who are on the continent, to constantly keep sharing information, educating each other, working with each other, reaching across the aisle and trying to develop opportunities to collaborate in business, in economics, sports, other aspects of culture, music. So we have got to see ways to synergize, to work together. One of the best stories that has come out of Africa this year is the bright stars of South Sudan, who are now creating a great impact, returning home, combining forces with those in South Sudan, and for the very first time, rising in rank in Africa, over 40 places, and nearly beating a superpower such as the US in basketball. And then again, if you look at the teams, the makeup of all these teams, it's the black nation. Wherever you go, 
if you look at the French football team, it's the chocolate brothers who are out there who are making that impact. These are the realities. So Africans, wherever you are, you have got to learn just to work together as a team. If you continue thinking that Pan-Africanism is dead, if it is dead in your mind, then it will stay dead. Yet, it is an opportunity for us to work. There's still a lot to be done. Africa Union certainly can do more. Independent African states certainly can do more. But the charity must begin from home. Until Africa can even get the basic homekeeping issues sorted, then it constantly looks like the average African does not want their brothers and sisters here on the continent. Not true. Not true. A lot more work still to be done. But the foreign influence can be seen. And sadly, the African leaders who are still under bondage, who are still under bondage working with the Western powers, borrowing money for their own use, influencing the economic empowerment of Western powers within their own economies. Those are the realities you're facing on the continent. So until we realize, until we realize that we're brothers and sisters and continue working together, we will be played again and again. Yet Africa is so well endowed, so well resourced, both in the soil in terms of minerals and above the soil in terms of human capital. A good number now going to the West and building the Western capitals. Hundreds of years after our own brothers and sisters, our ancestors were picked from Africa and helped to build the Western capitals that we see today. Is Pan-Africanism dead? Is that what you believe? Or is there an opportunity for diaspora Africa in the West and continental Africa to work together? That has got to be the thinking. Share your thoughts in the comments. This is Afrocentric. Many thanks for watching. If you're returning, I cannot thank you enough. We are now on the first journey to hitting 10,000 subscribers. It's a steady growth, but I believe we will get there. You know what they say, journey of 10,000 subscribers begins with you. A good 95% of those who are watching are not subscribed. So it's, it would be an honor if you can hit the subscribe button. Like and share. And we'll see you again in the next video. Many thanks and uh, peace and love.